Good day, everyone. Welcome back to the Kitchen Table Podcast on freethinkradio.com. So, last time I was at the kitchen table, it was back late in 2019. Uh, I was wrapping up the Canucks at the Kitchen Table series, which uh, was a fun series of episodes where I talked to Canadian YouTubers about Canadian politics and very Canuck-centered issues. And you can find all of uh, those episodes along with every past Kitchen Table episode over on the Freethink Radio YouTube channel. But now, here we are in 2020, and Kitchen Table Podcast is back with a whole new batch of episodes on the way. And I'm very happy to announce that this year, I am going to be exclusively covering the internet drama happening right now with Onision. Not really. Just just fucking with you. Um, But, for reals, this episode, I am actually very, very pleased to be welcoming Chris Dangerfield to the Kitchen Table. Dangerfield was one of the first guests that I ever wanted to have on this podcast, so this has been a long time in the making, and I think this episode was truly a very kitchen table discussion. Um, I generally try to be at least a little bit structured and a little bit like a real interviewer, but Chris is an excellent talker, and this conversation was recorded at 7 o'clock in the morning my time which was 7 o'clock in the evening, Chris's time in Cambodia. So this podcast comes to you from all corners of the globe. So anyway, it was very much uh, the most conversational of all the episodes I think I've ever done. But I really enjoyed it, and I hope that you guys will too. Um, Chris is a wonderful storyteller. He is a comedian, writer, commentator, YouTuber, entrepreneur, man of all seasons, and you can find him over on his YouTube channel, self-titled Dangerfield. Check it out, you'll find all kinds of great material there. So, um, just before we get to the good part, I just want to tell everyone quick what's happening on freethinkradio.com these days, because it's an awful lot. We've got live shows four nights out of the week. That kicks off every Monday with time for the show at 10 o'clock, all times in Eastern Standard Time. So we got time for the show, Mondays at 10, with Reverend Pease and Doc Fox. Then on Wednesday nights, we've got the Short Bus Podcast. That is open line. If you can find yourself to, uh, in the Freethink Radio Discord, you can find yourself on the Short Bus. Negative at Night happens Thursday nights, starting at 10.30. And then Fridays, it's fucking Fergin' Friday, every Friday, starting at 8, ending sometimes Saturday morning. And that is is the best tunes that I hear all week, every week. So please do check it out. And when there's not live shows, there's streaming music, there's classic retro radio rebroadcast programming, and all kinds of other random stuff going on. So check us out, freethinkradio.com. And without further to do, here is Chris Dangerfield at the kitchen table. But uh, yeah, amazing. Okay. Okay, we're There good. we go. <clears throat> Click talk. That's an important step. <laughs> talk. All right. I, All I right. don't know if you know an American podcast called the Dopey Podcast. It's an audio-only podcast. Millions of downloads. But man, the geezer are shocking. He's been doing it for about five years, and he can't do it and it's a, all workarounds as well it's like microphone next to a speaker you know no leads just to put in the mic next to the speaker it's amazing that he actually gets <coughs> excuse me anything off the ground but yeah so this is all cool excellent excellent all right we're all set to go welcome chris dangerfield thank you thank so you. much for being here you are the very first uh free think radio guest to uh, appear from well from anywhere in that part of the world especially from Cambodia I thought you'd forgot then <laughs> <laughs> when you went from well anywhere I did you forget a little bit and did you stall for time uh, I forgot the proper uh, term <laughs> for uh, that what would you call that East Asia I guess Southeast or Asia Southeast Asia there we go well it's a ple- it's an honor to be the first <laughs> Welcome to Canadian Radio, Canadian Internet Radio. Amazing. So you've had a YouTube channel for, what, four or five years now? I Long think it's near, I think it's about four, yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I think I've been following it for a, a good two or three anyway. Good, thank you. No, thank you. It's great content. 
everyone should check it out. Yes, and I wanted to, I wanted Sorry, to say on. too, uh, as uh, obviously as a Brit, although coming to us Kim from from Cambodia, happy Brexit. Well, and what an amazing thing. I, I One of my subscribers managed to get on stage at the celebrations in Parliament Square, and I think it was Parliament Square, and he was fil- he filmed the whole thing for like a couple of metres behind Nigel Farage. And I watched that footage today, and a mate of mine went up there, and he reported it to me, and all the airs on the back of my neck were standing up. And I mentioned this in a stream last night. As I was watching, because I've watched other footage before this, as I've been watching it, it made me remember how how we don't get the opportunity to celebrate being patriotic. We don't get the opportunity to have a a, a group consciousness. I've never had that in England. Or I had a I had a state school education uh, and a liberal art school higher education. And from start to finish, it was very negative about England and the English, very negative about the British, very negative about being patriotic. And not just very negative, I mean anti-British, anti-English. And, you know, I think I think it's fair enough to say the establishment are terrified of um, people getting together as, in those kind of groups because it starts reminding people of who they are and what they are and what's been stolen from them and so watching those celebrations it was it was very emotional for me actually in in a very positive way i can i can absolutely imagine even just watching nigel's eu speech um, oh, that was great for me uh you know fairly disconnected from the whole process even when i watched it i got a little ooh you know it's <laughs> <laughs> it was a real moment and with the flags and then that uh, you know, kind of sour. You know, oh my gosh! I mean, it was all well, quite a scene. That that you you can tell exactly by that. I mean, you know, it, obviously that the the people at the EU, uh, the European Parliament, don't support us leaving. Obviously, but at least understand that for us and for Nigel and his people there, this is a significant historical moment. And this is politics. This isn't. You don't get arsy at people about that sort of thing. You don't get all snooty. And you know, she was just sort of. It was like she was wiping something nasty off her shoe. And I just thought that that for me that really sums up their whole approach because all all Nigel Farage was doing was responding to a democratic vote. This is what the people of our country decided, and she just treated them just just terribly. And yeah, goodbye. And, and yeah, someone good suggested riddance. it was yeah. Someone suggested it was uh, au revoir. <laughs> I think <laughs> not. <laughs> So, no, and it definitely seems like they tried to put uh, the damper on the celebrations in London. Yeah, well, they, we, we weren't allowed to have Big Ben um, strike. You know, Big Ben is the bell. I mean, we call Big Ben the building and the bell, but it's actually the bell. And we, we weren't allowed that. We had to have a recording. Um, we, we weren't allowed to, I think there was a fake clock being um, projected or something, and you know, I mean, I could go into a, a, a rant about the whole simulations thing, but yeah, I mean, this is that bell was rung at, at regular sort of historical moments for our history, and for it not to, just to appease the remainers, was I think disgraceful, absolutely disgraceful. And part of what I was just saying to you about this is about them trying to take the power out of something that they fear. I think, I think, if it. To to have Big Ben chiming, the actual Big Ben would have been would have legitimated it, you know, would have given it so much. Well, it would have it would have it would have allowed people to see it for actually what it was, rather than this continual downplaying. Mm. Yeah, yeah, they've really done. <clears throat> seems like they've done a, a lot to try to downplay it. But similarly to the way you see a lot of the mainstream media try to downplay the popularity of trump in the u.s i think it's yeah. a very similar phenomenon and then and but they're 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 a funny lot the media i mean absolutely disgusting i mean they're they're really holding on to their power at the moment um and they're sliding downhill and grinding their fingernails down with with the you know the last few years new media alternative media whatever you want to call it is it's getting more views than them it's having i think i think trump and 
perhaps to a certain extent Brexit was almost like the battle of the medias I think it was alternative media versus the legacy media as Stix Hexenhammer calls it it's a good name because you know we, we've been we've been privy to information we didn't used to get you know even in my childhood in my teens when it came when it came to election time you watched the television you bought your newspapers and that was it so you 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 kind of voted for whoever had the most money at the time and could put the most information in front of your face but that's really changed and i think the likes of brexit and the likes of trump are the fruit of that change you know and it's early days i mean trump's not my man for sure he's not but he's he's a lot more my man than the rest of them so for me that's uh it's certainly a positive sign yeah. yeah, and I think, uh, well, it'll be interesting to see now that we're back in another American election year, how it plays out this time around. I heard that Hillary said she's going to give it another go. <laughs> Please, oh, <Jesus>. do. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Please <laughs> do. Yeah. yeah, do us all a favor. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it, it's a bit like in England. I mean, the, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure if you're aware of the gravitas of what happened in England, but... For the Tories to get that kind of majority, and you know, uh, oh, it was town... a record, record smashing, wasn't it? Yeah, but yeah. you know, there's places who voted for Tory that have literally never, never voted for Conservatives. You know, you're talking grandparents, parents, children who have been, you know, Labour in the blood. You know, hate the rich, all that old nonsense. Miners, mining towns, or whatever that suffered under Thatcher, and so it's it's absolutely massive. And then, yeah. and then the day after, the day after, you've got all the the loony left, as they've always been called in England, and the likes of Momentum, who are the sort of far left beating heart of failure within the Corbynista regime. You know, they you, they were on social media the next day saying we lost the election, but we won the argument. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> well, oh. Feel free to keep winning arguments. Uh, you know, yeah. you're welcome to them. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny, you know, even though in Canada, federally, we still have Trudeau, who is like a poster boy for it left in progressive insanity. Um, but provincially in Ontario, we had a very similar thing happen in our last provincial election where the liberals, the incumbent liberals who have been kind of governing the province for the last over a decade, um, were just thrown out like they lost so many seats that they lost their official party status wow uh, yeah just annihilated <laughs> i mean i didn't i didn't follow it closely but there was i did see a few talks and there was one lad that seemed quite interesting but he was obviously being being written off as a racist and nazi the usual stuff and i, I tell you what i mean it's similar it's the same subject but a different angle i saw the i saw ezra levant talking about um trudeau the other day and He's had he's been um, interviewed by the police about his book. Have you seen this? <clears throat> yeah, um, I did see the. Uh, I saw some snippets of what Ezra put out from when he was brought in to, uh, yeah, to discuss that's his it. book. Yeah, and it's uh, you know Ezra's got a little bit of uh, for once because he's usually a kind of persona non grata. Yeah, for um, sure. But <laughs> But for once, he actually has got some kind of uh, mainstream media support, um, oh, some wow. op-eds and editorials coming out, because it really is just, like, beyond the pale what's happened. Um, I guess just a quick fill in anyone who, who's listening who's not aware, Ezra uh, Levant wrote a book about Trudeau called Libranos, uh, obviously not a very charitable review of Trudeau. Uh, and it came out, I think, a month or two before our last federal election. So what they're trying to do now is they're trying to um, bring charges or fines against Ezra for not registering his book as part of an election campaign, which is <laughs> just insane, right? Because how many other books came out about Trudeau or about other political leaders, and they've never been asked or expected or, you know... <laughs> let alone had had to come in to explain themselves in front of RCMP investigators, right? There was something really bizarre. I mean, go and check it out for yourself. It's on the Rebel Media website. But there was one weird bit where they said something, and Ezra said, 
Oh, so you're saying if I released a book at the same time that wasn't critical of Trudeau, that wouldn't be a problem. And although they didn't agree to that, that was kind of what they said. <laughs> it's just yeah. absurd. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. Without, uh, I know the uh, the question you're talking about is kind of, you know, without giving him a direct answer, they basically confirmed it. It was, uh, yeah. yeah, but I mean, it's, it's hard too because Ezra's really got a target on his back. It doesn't really excuse the situation, but I feel like there's probably a lot of uh, personal histories and behind the scenes vendettas yeah. that are all going yeah. into this too. Because well, I mean, he's, he's sorry, definitely made himself uh, a real thorn in the side for a lot of people. Well, and we need these people, you know, they're essential. Yeah. But I, I also think it's very easy to get uh, pessimistic. It's very easy to lose motivation when you look at the scale of the censorship. And, you know, England is just, you know, the whole thing with Count Dankiller. I mean, you know, that that really oh. set the bar low. Yeah. And all this and kind of stuff. And, and, and very easy to get sort of, you know, blackpilled about it. But for me, I think it's a very good sign because I think this is a response. This, is, this isn't them setting things up. Um, offensively, this is them realising that they're losing control of narratives, and so they're starting to think, oh, we've got to shut people up and that says to me that what people are doing, what we're doing, is working you know, it's working, they're scared they're running scared so yeah. I'd rather them not be doing it, but I do see it as a response, and the more draconian the measures um, the more they're suffering, so you know, good. Yeah, the more the 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 bigger the backlash. It seems anyway. It seems to be going that way. But yeah, the stuff that goes on in the UK just blows my mind. Um, not just Count Dankula, but uh, what's happened with Posey Parker too. Yeah, yeah. Who's been on your channel. Um, like the fact that she's been called in for uh, what? What do they call it? Uh, like questioning under advice or something like that. I, I I don't know about her case in particular, but they do this weird thing where you're not under arrest, but it, it really doesn't help you if you don't go, so you sort of have to go, sort of, it's, it's kind of unless you've got a kind legal of, team. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and for people who don't know, she got in trouble, she put up a billboard, and all it said, all it had on it was the word woman, and underneath the dictionary definition of woman. And in England, that's hate speech. <laughs> it got taken down. I mean, yeah. what the hell is going on? Yeah, it's just, it's clown world, really. You know what, as I just said that then for the first time, and you know, you, as you know, you watch my channel, I've been involved in this stuff for a few years now. But I just for the first time then thought, maybe... This, the, maybe the angle is that it's, it's so bizarre, so surreal. That might be, <coughs> excuse me, that might be their approach. You know, just just go in so crazy that people will sort of won't see the wood for the trees or whatever it is. Because that's madness, isn't it? That Posey Parker thing. Just you can't put the dictionary definition of woman on a billboard. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this it's disorienting it's so yes. crazy yes yeah. that's what i meant you nailed it yeah. yeah exactly that it kind of puts makes you have a, a bit of vertigo almost <laughs> and 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 then you're unable to do anything about it because you're too busy trying to stand up straight no that's a great word yeah it's disorienting yeah brilliant <laughs> yeah yeah no that blows my mind posies uh i i um started i don't know if I found Posey a little before or after I saw her on your channel, but uh, she's a great lady. She's yeah, got for sure. A lot, of, a lot of gumption. <laughs> yep, I'm going on her channel. I think next week or week after, so that's fun. Should be very interesting, actually. She, um, I keep, I keep spamming her chats with uh, pro nationalist talk, <laughs> and she said something about nationalism that I think she's got it wrong, and so I'm going to pull her on that on her show. So that could be interesting. Definitely. That will be very interesting. It's funny, I see, uh, because Posey is very focused on her project, which is keeping a lot of trans ideology out of uh, elementary schools, basically. Um, not just trans, the idea, pushing of kind of trans lifestyles and ideologies and, you know, sexual well, lifestyles that are very much more adult <laughs> than they well, are. I think, I think the... 
the issue with Posey for me is, and this is the kind of thing I put in a chat and I get everyone to give me a one if they agree and it's just a flurry of ones. It's like, for me, Posey is right on the cusp of bit, you know, what we call being red-pilled. She's almost there. She's got this sort of, you know, this um, what this sort of single issue that she fights for and, 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 and so she should. But yeah. she hasn't actually questioned why. She hasn't thought about why. Why is there this? Why is there exceptionally powerful trans lobby? Why are they attacking women in the family? And I think once she makes that next step up and she looks at the bigger picture, that's when I think she's really in for a shock. You know, she's already yeah. shocked and, and rightly so. Yeah. But you know, as far as <coughs> excuse me, I seem to have got something in my throat. As far as I'm concerned, this is a, a much bigger agenda against families, against communities, against England, Britain and Europe. And I think, you know, once she starts asking why, and I don't think she wants to. I think she's no. got enough on her plate, but I'm sorry, Posey, I'm imagine. coming for you. <laughs> yeah. But it's diff it's hard, though, uh, and it's something I kind of wanted to get your opinion on. Um, it's a nice little lead into it. You know, with all of these, it seems for a lot, of, or a lot of people or a lot of times, I guess, that all of these kind of things that are happening in Western societies generally, like breakdown of family, this really strong trans LGBT lobby that's kind of overstepping some boundaries for people, <laughs> things like um, just all the progressive agenda points, you know, it's hard for people to see them as connected. And when you suggest sometimes that they are, it's hard not to sound like a bit of a, a conspiracy theorist. Mm. Um, I, you know, for people who aren't, I guess, um, following current events and news maybe as closely as, as you or I or some other people who kind of might see all the ways the dots are connected. So, I mean, how do you really, how do you, how do you approach that? How would you kind of uh, get that across without showing your tinfoil hat <laughs> <laughs> well um i mean it's it's very complicated i i don't i don't think it's as simple as like a, a pyramid of power i think you know it's a little bit more sort of sporadic and um manipulative really but what you know why why have the, the the trans lobby given so much power why are we pandering to the the demands of 0. Something like 0.02 percent of the population, and 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 changing our our culture for those people. Bearing in mind the majority of them, as far as I'm concerned, aren't interested in it. You know, I spent 10 years living in Soho, and I know plenty of trans people, and they have got nothing to do with all this. They just yeah. don't. Most of them don't even know about it. I mean, that's the weird <laughs> thing. And the ones who do, they're just like, you know, big exhalation and like oh just don't because it's put it's put emphasis on it's put the focus on them and they don't want it they just want to get on with their lives yeah. and you know it's how do you get to the bigger picture well you you know you just have to ask why and you you have to look at england of if, as far as i'm concerned like, you have to look at your country and you say well what's going wrong with the country and why and then and then if you want to if you can analyze what's going wrong with the country and how you're going to do something about that you you look at what um what obstacles you that are going to confront you so we want to make changes what's in our way and that's when you start understanding where these things come from this is you know the progressives I, I i use the word all the time i talk about the progressive orthodox and all this but i don't actually think they're one group i don't think they're like the illuminati sitting around a big table on a in a volcano somewhere making decisions <laughs> but With with their yeah. human masks over their lizard head. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but as a group, they hate themselves. They and and from there, you know, self loathing white people and from there they hate their nation and they want to destroy it. You know, I spent seven years in higher education, liberal arts education, and then uh, I done my master's degree in cultural studies, which is basically social justice twenty years ago. And um, luckily, I got to choose subjects that weren't too much of that, but I was still up to my neck in it on a daily basis. And they taught me how to hate my country, and they taught me how to hate my life and myself. Really, you know, I, it was a communist boot camp. You, you go to you go to yeah. at sixteen, you go to art school because you want to be a painter, and at twenty four, you come out reading Lenin. 
and you know and i mean that and that's what happened i know from experience not i i didn't do a i did a english uh, masters but it's basically the you know mm. same thing of course of i mean day. and then you think well hang on why why the why the hell i'm, I'm really trying not to swear so if i keep pausing that's why oh don't worry but, about it swear uh, away don't open the floodgates <laughs> 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 shit <laughs> um and you, well, and I, I I started looking at that, and I was thinking, what? Hang on, what the hell happened there? Why are all students either neutral and passive and ambiv, uh, not ambivalent? Um, uh, don't worry. Why are there so many communists coming out of universities? Why are all my school teachers so anti England and anti Britain and, and telling us that our flag was embarrassing and all this sort of stuff? And then you then you hear about the long march through the institutions that has come from sort of mid twentieth century communism and, 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 and as an actual plan. And then you, you step back from that and you're like, Well hang on, this this long march through the institutions, as far as I'm concerned, it was um it's remained largely unchallenged at the level of um, the the um, academy um, academia sorry uh, law and media and so yeah. you think hang on a minute the law media and education has been infiltrated by Marxists essentially yeah and these people want to destroy our country and then you look at things like mass controlled immigrant mass uncontrolled immigration which does destroy your country it's destroying England it's causing so many problems there we have an NHS a national health system which is basically open to the world you if you can get to England you can go and get a hip replacement for free now unfortunately yeah. that's madness you know yeah. you you can't have welfare and open borders it's just this very basic maths and so you look at all these, you know, they go, oh, we're going to put another 100 billion into the NHS. Well, you, I'm sorry, mate, you can keep throwing as much money at it as you want, but it's a bottomless pit because we're healing the world. Same with our welfare system. You know, we've got people coming to our country, five or six children, here's a house, here's money. Well, that that's the likes of me paying for that. It's not working. And so you start realising there's all these things, not, like I say, connected in a pyramid with like power coming down and, and all being played like puppets, but loads of different things that all together are basically progressive ideas, and they're wrecking our country. They're wrecking Europe. They're wrecking the West. And so you have to tackle those things, and you have to you have to work out how. And so that's... The kind of conversation yeah. I have with people, obviously it's more detailed in that because I'd have ten hours in the boozer with them. But that's kind of how I approach it. You identify obstacles, you identify problems, and then you have to start thinking about solutions. Yeah, well, and it's um, what you said about the uh, academy is just rings so true to me. It's like you can't do an arts degree of any kind anymore without it being basically a hundred percent critical theory. Yeah, you know. And yep. it's um, personally, I find it very frustrating and demoralizing. But uh, well, the, the, the mad thing about liberal arts education is, I mean, <clears throat> it's it's almost like the perfect wooden horse for these people because, you know, my my bachelor's degree, my first degree was um, like contemporary art, you know, performance art. It, I'd, I'd long given up painting after doing a couple of years of that, and as I sort of started taking more acid and losing my mind i ended up doing performance art you know proper out there stuff you know chuck your head chuck a bucket of jelly over your head read your mum's diary and then kick a dead rabbit and <laughs> everyone applauds I, I mean it that's a real yeah. example yeah and um <laughs> the problem with that kind of art and teaching it is well well a how do you teach that uh, exactly. practically and b how do you grade that i mean it's it's ridiculously subjective and when, and I used to see lecturers and, and 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 all that. They'd look at a piece of work which was that kind of thing, and they you know the the kid would get like a B. And then there was a girl who had um, some terrible childhood who was pouring water into the lids of the bottles, but because she was shaking, because she was nervous, she didn't manage to collect a lot of water in the lids, and she got a distinction. And it's like how the fuck do you distinguish between those pieces of work and give someone a distinction and someone a not a B, sorry, a credit? And and so what you've actually got isn't, the, not the teaching of art and not the grading of art, but you've got the teaching of ideas. And that's why they give you a reading list and it's Marx and it's all the French thinkers. I mean, I've still got a lot of respect for those thinkers. You know, I, I don't throw the baby out of the bathwater as, as the Frankfurt School. I mean, in my circles... 
um, I'm hated for it. You know, Jewish Marxist intellectuals aren't don't go down too well. But you know, um, the likes of Heidegger, uh, not Heidegger, sorry, um, Horkheimer and Adorno and Walter Benjamin, I've got a lot of time for. But this was my reading list then. Because that's all they can teach you. They can't put you in a room and say, this is how you read your mum's diary while covered in flour. You know, there's no actual practical teaching. So it is um, information. It is ideas. And they're not critical. I wasn't given Foucault's Discipline and Punish and told how to criticise it and how to evaluate its legitimacy or understand its historical position. I was told to read it because it made sense, you know. And that's why art, liberal arts educations are, uh, are basically ideas because you can't teach that subject. And it's, when you said English, of course I can understand that because what are they actually going to teach you? Grammar. <laughs> you know, it's just yeah. ridiculous. They can do that in the first week. And so after that, they're going to be giving <laughs> you books that basically um, expouse their kind of ideologies and they're yeah. all left-wingers. I, in, in, I don't know what it is in Canada, but in England, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's the same in Canada, but in England, I think in liberal arts, it's something like 98% of lecturers are, are far left, essentially Marxists. Oh, yeah, I'm sure it's similar in Canada. Um, but the thing that, that I found so frustrating as a graduate student was that... Um, there is no willingness in the department to do any kind of uh, real knowledge generating research, you know? There is no one who is really interested in kind of, oh, we're going to go, you know, back in the, um, I don't know, the special collections or the archives or we're going to find a new translation or we're going to do a new... You know what I mean? There is no... Um, well, well, the, the, what I'd like to ask you is, what what do you do on a on an English masters? What is it? Were you, were you doing English literature? Uh, well, my um, like my undergrad was in uh, medieval studies and uh, religious studies. So then I went into the English department to do a specialization in medieval and early modern uh, literature. So I was kind of uh, uh, an oddball. Um, most people in the program were doing things like. Uh, Canadian literature, modern literature, uh, stuff like that. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of my own silliness, I guess, that I ended up in this department in the first place. But <laughs> like, Likewise me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd have done a STEM subject. <laughs> oh, Jesus, I know, I know. Yeah. Could, could be a going biologist to now. Go, and going, you know to what? Wait, going to wait tables thinking about my English master's degree and wishing I'd done chemistry, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the mad thing is, of course, these are the people that tend to get away with it as well. I mean, I've had a, you might have seen, I've had a couple of teens on, and although they're studying STEM, STEM subjects, they are still exposed to a lot of social justice and progressive ideas. However, yeah. it's not full-time. Mine was full-time, every aspect of it. You know, I had exactly. to study feminism, and God, yeah. you could not criticise it. You weren't allowed to. You, you tried. I tried. And I was called the usual names. And admittedly, at the time, I was 19, so I wasn't the most sort of articulate and eloquent. I was just very angry because mm -hmm. I thought, what is this? This is, this is, this is just man-hating. And I, I know that's a, a kind of crude analysis, but it was. It just was. And listen to this yeah. kind of madness. I remember, you know, I broke so many times I broke and just thought, just, just you know, this, this is your problem, Chris. You've got problems. You must hate women. Why can't you? Because know, I was told that. And, uh, yeah. and looking back, I can assure you that's far, you know, that's not true. <laughs> On the contrary. But I remember talking to this one woman, Rose Garrard. She's a very famous artist and art critic in England. And she was visiting lecturer. And I remember during one of my broken periods, properly cucked, I, I went up to her and I said, look, I've been thinking about what you said. And I don't have many... Um, when I look at my music collection, it's mainly male vocalists. And, you know, when I read literature, it's mainly male writers. And now I think that's absolutely fair enough. And I think, you know, it, it wouldn't matter if it was all women or all men. It's just up to me. And she said to me, well, you know, this is because you've got issues and problems around women and it's probably to do with your mother. And I suggest that you spend a few months listening to female singers and reading only women's texts. And 
time come. to buy some Annie DeFranco CDs and uh... <laughs> yeah, that was, I, I, that's what it was like. And yeah, you know that's really destructive because I don't I don't read male writers. I still do now uh, because I don't like women, but because I identify with men. Because amazingly, I am one. You know, it was just disgusting. And at the time, that stuff really confused me, really ashamed, made me feel ashamed and, and, and was very negative upon me. And I'll never, I'll never forgive those bastards for all that because it's the same with the communism thing. Once you become a communist, you can't enjoy your life because you live in a society that's privileged and that means someone somewhere suffered and anything you've got that's good means that, you know, they've got this bullshit understanding of how the world works and so anything you experience that's good and joyful is because somewhere else, someone in the world's really suffered and you go through life thinking like that. You can't enjoy yourself. And, you know, yeah. as you know, I spent a lot of my adult life addicted to heroin and that's because of decisions I made. However, they were decisions I made on the back of seven years of communist indoctrination, which left me very depressed, very empty, yeah. very pessimistic and very guilty. And I yeah. didn't I didn't sign up for that. And you trust these people, you know, you pay money to these people. They're lecturers. It's university. I had an understanding of university that I inherited in the 70s that this is where the clever kids went. And you were privileged yeah. to be there and you've done what you were told. And I thought I'd come out there. You know, I thought I'd be walking around the grounds holding my books in front of me like I'd seen on the telly because no one in my family went to university. And seven years later, actually, I'm wearing a fucking chairman mouse suit and shrieking at people at parties about fucking George Lukash. <laughs> Just absurd. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really is. It's um, it's so entrenched in, in the university that, yeah, I mean, if you don't buy into that thinking, you become a total black sheep you know it's uh it's hard to exist in the, well, the university it's not it's not only your your black sheep social standing but your grades as well you know oh, if, yeah. you're, if you're Absolutely. writing your essay and your essay is you know about the revolution that's going to mean the difference between you getting a, a decent grade and them hating you oh i mean absolutely I, I, First hand, a first hand experience. My final year as a graduate student, um, I ended up in this seminar about Canadian literature, and my prof was just a raging uh, SJW. She actually wrote uh, an article about um, how Canadians who go canoeing are culturally appropriating uh, native mm. spirituality, and we're all just awful colonialists, and we should abandon any kind of connection to this country because we are you know imposters here and all of that kind of thing right you know, that, that's exactly what i mean that joyless yeah. kind of guilting you yeah oh yeah yeah something as simple and uh you know as wholesome and that you know basically every canadian can relate to and enjoy something like canoeing well i'm just going to yep. take that from you because you don't deserve it yeah, like, just sick. Yeah, and you know, I, you know, I, I, I am to an extent a Freudian, and I am to an extent a Derridian, and I do believe I do like the Marxist method of historical materialism, and I, I understand that motivations and that things aren't as obvious as they appear, and you can look behind even something as simple as canoeing. However, it doesn't make it negative. It doesn't make it a bad thing. It just means that there's there's more going on the, than meets the eye. I get exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. But this this crazy guilting, you know, it's just absurd. Yeah, yeah. and that's Damaging. always a, it's always a funny kind of contradiction that they never want to address. You know, is that for uh, yeah. academics to have such a, a you know, supposedly such a broad range of interpretations and, you know, everything can be quite subjective. But when it comes down to <laughs> the kind of progressive ideology, all of a sudden everything is very concrete. That, that's right? a great point. I saw that coming. It's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the multiplicity of interpretations, but surprise, surprise, this one. <laughs> yeah. It only means this. <laughs> But, but, you know, it's heartbreaking, though, really, because I, your listeners won't know, but I've done a series talking to teenagers, just chatting to them, and admittedly they're from the, a small slither of the demographic who watch my YouTube channel. But I think three of them 
were at university, all three of them were getting this bullshit um, pumped into them, and none of them were doing arts courses. And I think two of them were considering leaving, and they're in their first year. And oh. the problem with that, of course, is the people that are staying are the people that are going to go off and become the professionals, the people that are going to go off and become the next lecturers. And so the cycle just repeats itself. They manage to weed out anyone who's sort of slightly critical. And do you yeah. really want to be weeding out critical people when you're looking at the next teachers? What? <laughs> it's absurd. No, no and that's, uh, well, it's like, and it's like you were saying, the way that this has all become very entrenched in the academy and the media and the law is because we've had this whole generation go through, or at least one whole generation go through now, being very, you know, in, I don't know if maybe indoctrinated is too strong a word, but we'll say indoctrinated into this kind of progressive ideology. And it's I saw too soft the word. It's too soft the word. <laughs> Too soft, okay. <laughs> but uh, I saw in your stream uh, just the other day you were making a point that I've agreed with for some time now, and you were saying that you know all of the commentary and politics and media um, is great, but at the end of the day, it's really going to be a you know change has to come from a a body of a population and, and it has to be a cultural change. You know, mm. I mean politics and tax incentives and economics and everything you know is important but at the end of the day it's not what really will change or will drive a you know a zeitgeist yeah no for sure i think this is really important um and i think having lived in cambodia for a couple of years i've got to see a different culture and and how um, everyday cultural behaviours and, and practices really affect their way of life. And, you know, it, it, they're kind of interdependent, the politics and the culture, and they both feed off each other and affect each other. But, yeah, I think I, I certainly in England, for there to be the kind of changes that I want, the changes that are going to save England and save Europe, it, there's going to have to be radical change at a cultural level. You know, England has lost its communities. They've gone. They've just gone. They've been taken away from us. And and simple things like that. And the family, the family is so under attack. We're not breeding anywhere near replacement level. And that hasn't just been an accident of history. This has been organized. You know, if you, you, you I, I grew up in the 70s and 80s. And if you remember the 80s, <laughs> you know about the 60s, yeah. they say, if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. If you remember the 80s, unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, it was all about this aggressive individualism. You know, I can remember just as soon as I sort of become a man, you know, I hit puberty and all those messages were just get out there, get rich, have fun, have sex, don't commit to anything, don't don't have any responsibility in your life, succeed, which meant owning loads of things and having loads of money and, and speedboats and all that sort of nonsense. And, you know, this sort of mad, mad sort of flight to barbaric meaninglessness because without any responsibility in your life, there's no meaning. Exactly. And, you know, none of my friends wanted to get married. And, and in fairness, a couple of them have now, but in their 40s. And, yeah. and so they kind of done it late. And, you know, I didn't. And, again, my choices, but I feel like I... Have really missed out there. I, I regret not having children younger. I regret not getting married younger. I should have married my first girlfriend. But, you know, as my, I absolutely loved that girl, but there was always this nagging thing in my head about, no, go yeah. out, get more, get more. She's going to hold you back. You don't want yeah. a family. And I know where that came from. And it and yeah. it wasn't my family. And it wasn't part of my culture. I mean, because the the... the communities had already started disappearing then i was abandoned i felt abandoned by i i didn't have a culture you know that is an abandonment and so i just done what i was told and ended up in rehab <laughs> you know that, that's where it got me and these things need to change the communities need to be rebuilt the family needs to find a new um 
people need to be motivated into this when they realize what the what the options are they're not what they tell you there's not this great there's not a great life out there without these things i think you'll find very quickly and you know look at the amount of drug addicts look at the opioid crisis in america yeah. look at the amount of time people spend sitting looking at their computer games and all that there's a reason for that they 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 they're bored they're screwed they're demotivated they're alienated they're atomized they're lost children at 40 and 50 years old yeah it's quite the state it's quite the state of affairs and i think uh, you kind of were hitting the nail on the head there with the kind of expectations we grew up with in the 80s and and in the 90s, I think, too, for, like, a lot of 90s kids. You know, you have get this anxiety, almost, about uh, having these weird expectations that, uh, you know, a, a marriage or a family or a kind of st- a stable life in, isn't glamorous enough or isn't well, free it, enough. Exactly, isn't but... But what is a glamorous life? You know, I've I've hung around with supermodels and the, the, the best of them, and they're all drug addicts, literally all of them. And if right. they're not, they've got depression. If they're not, they've got OCD. It's not a good look. It's not a good life. It, it no. looks good on the surface. It's a very good superficial life. It, it appears wonderful. But, you know, there's a reason that humanity has, has collected in communities and families since time began. Because it provides, it gives you what you need, not what, you know, it, it's not very good for selling things, though. You know, that's the problem. You don't need much when you've got what you yeah. need. When you, And, you know, I was never, I was never encouraged to get married at my school. You know, did not even, didn't even come up. We didn't even talk about it. Why no. the hell would you not educate kids in that, they, these basics? I don't know. It's a good point, though. I've never really considered that oh, it's crazy, crazy before. But it was the same uh, same as I was going through uh, public school. And I think it may have been already a bit of the, the political correctness kind of rules coming in that there were already so many kids from divorced homes that maybe it was like, well... We can't, we can't, you know, we can't suggest but that the mad maybe thing is, something sorry. is better than something else, you know. But the Everyone mad is, thing is, if, if you've got loads of kids who are from broken homes and divorced families, this is why you should be pushing it, not <laughs> shut up about it. It's absurd. I reckon, I'll, I'll put this to you, I reckon if from primary school up they started teaching civics why is there no civics that's te- taught at school they should be teaching kids about the greek city state about the creation of the polis about the creation of the domestic realm start teaching people about the basics of civilization and how that's gone through and why does why do civilizations end what happened to rome what happened to the mongols what happened to the ottoman empire why do these things end and and, and they teach you things like that i guarantee kids will be leaving school with a with a good education getting a job finding a wife or finding an husband having kids building communities because they'd realize how important that was not just to them but to their nation and to their community and they'd realize the value in nation and the value in community and the value it's had historically and they'd also know what happens when you don't have those things and it's absolute carnage that's when you end up at war that's when people end up yeah. dropping firebombs on children. That's when mil- 60 million people in the Ukraine or China starve to death and they put up posters saying, don't eat your dead children. This is That stuff doesn't happen by accident and humans aren't so stupid they can't organise themselves in a way to prevent that. That stuff only happens when the basics are forgotten because progressive fools hate themselves and decide to project that onto society at large. Yeah, but you'd never know it as an elementary school kid, because no one will ever tell you. <laughs> they, they don't even go near it. I've just realized it's only about half seven for you. It's a bit much, isn't it? <laughs> Morning. <laughs> oh, no, no. I'm I'm about, uh, I'm almost to the bottom of a large coffee here, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> a feel like I'm, of stimulants. I feel like I'm hanging in there. I mean, look at the, you know, the, the ridiculous literature at school. I mean, I was taught Shakespeare. Right, listen, I love Shakespeare. Fantastic. Wrote every story almost. But not when I'm 14. I mean, give me a break. Yeah. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> and then, you know, uh, uh, how to put kids off literature. You might have heard me on my stream. The amount of teenagers I've known in my life, and as I've grown up, you talk about a book and they go, I hate books, I hate reading. 
and that is heartbreaking yeah. uh, and that doesn't come from nowhere that is learned behavior that's what happens when you take a 14 year old boy who is nowhere near as mature as the 14 year old girls in his class and you tell him to sit down shut up in a beautiful summer's day he wants to be out running around he wants to be out fighting uh, playing sports learning about hierarchies learning about groups and you've got him sitting down reading fucking shakespeare and it's just ridiculous and he'll never look at another book in his life what a thing to steal from a young person the joy of literature just just taken in an instant yeah <clears throat> well and i guess it won't matter much because now if they ever make it to university shakespeare will be taken out of the the canon as <laughs> the old white male anyway right yeah, cool. So he'll be reading about something. Look, don't get me wrong. He'll be reading some African author that's writing about growing up in Nairobi or something, and which is probably a great bit of literature, but it means nothing to him. That's the same as the geezer in Nairobi reading Shakespeare. It's pointless. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's a real tragedy. But, yeah, to go back to your original point, these are the kind of cultural um, changes, radical cultural changes that need to be made um, if we're going to actually make some changes because yeah. britain and the and west is falling apart it seems kind of bleak though in a way too because um i don't know i mean i guess i don't really know what the kids are doing these days i'm like a, i'm basically an old lady now but it doesn't seem to me like there is any kind of uh change on the horizon you know like there's i, I feel like all of the kind of generations mine included and and before mine all had a kind of uh like a a moment their moment in time you know like their cultural contribution their music their art their their writers and i i don't know maybe i'm out of touch but i kind of am almost worried that is there's like a void right now of of actual cultural production no, I think you're absolutely right. I think we reached a, a kind of end of history. Uh, we're completely atomized. I mean, I grew up, there was one music chart, and so you've got a collective. Everyone would look at the same chart, but now there's about 100 different charts, so little groups of disparate... Yes atomized yes. people look at them and that's all part of the same thing now don't get me wrong i'm not saying we need to necessarily reverse that if you actually had radical change at a cultural level that would happen anyway because people would there'd be value in things and things uh, cultural production would be aware of its social um, role and function whereas it's completely void of that now it's all about celebrity and it's all about uh, aesthetics so you know that's gone but no you're absolutely right again but again it's the same as that um the, the what we talked about right at the beginning about the brexit thing i don't know if we were recording them but the the establishment doesn't want people understanding its group consciousness it it wants everyone divided because they're weak and and, and they don't understand the, the power of their group consciousness and you know something as silly as pop music has has created groups and given them not a hell of a lot of power but certainly enough to sort of make them start thinking about something yeah. or a sense of identity you know a yeah. sense of collective identity at the very least you know yeah and that's gone i mean let me give you a lovely little example there was a time in i can't remember exactly late 80s and uh there was a big storm in the southeast of England. And, you know, England doesn't really have dramatic weather. It's just drizzle. It's just, you know, it never, it never pours around here. It just rains. And um, <clears throat> there was this mad storm and, and, you know, little sheds were flying up and down the road. Things were getting turned upside down. And my dad woke me and my brother and my mum up. We all lived upstairs. And, and he said, look, we've got to go downstairs because the, um, the chimney stack, you know, these are these houses were over 100 years old. He said if the chimney stack might blow in, it will fall through the roof and we'll all die. So we've all gone downstairs. Because of the storm, there was no television. But my dad got out this old shortwave radio. And because of the technology of shortwave, or something like this, it might have been long waves. Excuse the details. I was only about 13. But it was the old, you know, when you move the dial and it's like... <laughs> And then you occasionally yeah. get to someone speaking in Dutch. <laughs> but then there's a bit of brass band music. And finally, you get through this sort of English voice. 
and me and my mum my dad and my brother were huddling around that it was battery operated there was no power so we couldn't have the telly on there was no heat we had hot water bottles that my mum managed to get on the gas stove and we were huddled around this radio like images I'd seen of the second world war and there was this real sense that the whole the whole of the south east of England must have been doing that because there was no electricity so no one could have been watching telly and and there, for the first time in my childhood, I had a sense of a national um, identity. I felt like everyone was doing the same thing. And it was bliss. Even at 13 or something like that, 11, 13. Yeah. I remember thinking there was something so nice about this. There's something that I've been, that's been taken from me and my experience of life. A sense of being part of something big and, and everyone everyone working for everyone else you know it was like how can people help people the radio the man on the radio was saying if there's anyone in seven oaks it's so and so if you can get down and if you've got a tow bar this and you know and yeah i I, I remember just feeling it was lovely and you know that that should be normal that should be a daily experience yeah but it's uh it's not it's just like a a one-off you know emergency it's so funny you say that it was almost the same thing um, where I grew up when I was maybe about the same age probably. We had a, a horrific ice storm. Um, and all power was out for weeks and weeks, of just ice taking all the trees, telephone poles, hydro poles, everything down. And uh, the same thing. All of a sudden everyone was forced to get out their battery-powered AM radio, listen to the local station, find <laughs> out where you know, where the water was going to be distributed, where that people could go for this, who needed help. Yeah, it's it's amazing, amazing that the only time we get that sense of collective community now is when we lose all the power. Yeah, I mean, I, there's, there's two war films. There's Apocalypse Now. I try and avoid favourites in life because I feel like I'm not growing and changing if I've got a favourite, if I have the same... Anyway, that's another story. But Apocalypse Now is a favourite of mine. And the other one, I can't remember what it was, but... The scene in the other one, there was a couple and they were, they'd were they fallen in love during the Second World War in England. And, uh, you know, there's obviously the Second World War in England was horrific. And they had this mad romance and uh, they, were all, they were out helping everyone. It was the Blitz and all this stuff happening. And um, victory in Europe was called. The war was over. And the, the couple were there and they realised that the signalling of, signaling, signaling of the end of the war also signalled the end of their, if, if not relationship, certainly the the way it was up until then. And and everyone was, everyone in the street was, yay, victory in Europe, the war is over, and everyone was celebrating. And these two were looking at each other, and they it was the saddest they'd been in the whole movie because oh, they wow. realised that for the first time in their life, they needed each other. They needed their community. Um, they were needed. They had an actual role. They had responsibility yeah. uh, on a national level, which gave their lives meaning, and and all this. And the, in in Apocalypse Now, there's the absolute uh, warmongering psychopath called um, Colonel Kilgore, I think it is. And he's a maniac, don't get me wrong. He's the one who goes surfing when there's all bombs going off and everyone else is ducking as bombs go off and he's just standing up with his Stetson on, just looking around to see when the surf's good. And there's a bit where he turns around to this bloke and there's literally people dying around them. And he says to him, he says, he goes, you know, one day, son, and he sort of takes a deep breath and he goes, this war's going to end. And he looks devastated. Yeah. And the the, the point being, regardless of the fact that he's a warmongering loony, exactly the same as the people in the other film he's got he's got a group he's got a nation to defend he's got uh, he's got a, a, a community and you know we miss these things and they're, they're 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 essential to us and i think those two moments in those films and there's countless other films which do the same thing you know we love a disaster yeah. movie because it brings everyone together and i think the the message there is exactly that we miss these things so much that would actually a war carry on just so that we can have them in our lives. You know, I, I've often yeah. felt that I should have been a soldier because, it, you know, although the hell of war, and I'm not underplaying that at all, it's the most ridiculous, barbaric thing, 
but it would have given me actual reason. You know, it would have given me the things that the crappy culture I've inherited have stolen from me. Yeah, yeah, the sense of purpose is uh, yeah. hard to come by for sense of purpose, for sense of community, sense of yeah. nation. And, and and because of all that, if you take responsibility, you then get meaning. And you know, I I, I don't want to go on. I don't, let's not get too much into my novel, or you won't shut me up. But I'm just coming <laughs> to the end of six years writing a novel, and I've, I've never really known what it's been about. And you obviously don't know because you haven't got any words at the beginning. Now I've got 120,000. I've just this is what I'm realising it's about. It's autobiographic of kind of bits of my life, but. It's just been endless meaninglessness and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, almost a search for local kind of catastrophes to to give myself a, to give the character which is me a sense of meaning and no one's got it and, and so it's, it's very Camus of you <laughs> yeah man you said the right thing <laughs> but no honestly I'm, I'm really I'm looking forward to your to your novel absolutely. Well, I've, I plan on getting my hands on a copy of that. I was that. about to say, um, I reckon your estimation might go down once you read it. If you come back <laughs> to me and said how very Camus of you after you've read it, I'll give you a tenner. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I think you'll say how very danger filled. <laughs> <laughs> but um, all right, this is we're having a lovely conversation but I would like to get to a few things um, that I did want to ask you about and not keep you here um, for too too long no problem but uh, so I really uh, like as we mentioned you know you're in Cambodia grew up in Britain very much still you know focused or at least tuned into things that are happening in the UK and in the West more generally so I mean what's that like being physically somewhere in a in a culture that's almost as far removed as you could get from the West and from first world politics and problems, um, you know, having that as your surroundings and then kind of seeing what's happening in the the more developed parts of the world and, and in your home, I imagine that must be a very kind of strange and very striking contrast sometimes. I always yeah. kind of wondered, just, you know, kind of your more general impressions that have come to you from that. Well, I think I touched on it briefly before, but maybe before we were recording, one of the times when it's most apparent, when, when the times I get to see England clearly, when I get a bit of critical distance, because when you're there and in it, it's very hard to get a, a, a sort of critical distance from it. But the, the, the real moments of clarity I get it when I'm out here and I realise what happens here and, and the way they are here, and then I get something to compare it to. And that's when it becomes very clear to me things in England that are broken. Um, in, in terms of the other things you ask, the, the biggest problem is other people on the dissident right calling me out for it. Some people don't like it. They think I can't have the views I have unless I live in England. And that, that yes. can be quite painful and upsetting. Um, I don't let it upset me too much. But, you know, there's practical reasons. I was paying an absolute fortune to live in London. And I'm not here. And without a doubt, that has freed up time. Where, time that I can spend reading. I can spend making content rather than having to work my ass off just to pay for a, a shitty little bedsit to live in. Um, and also, I don't like England at the moment. I don't like it. It's not nice. It's not a nice place to live. And you could argue that, well, you should still live there. You can't tell people they need to change. Well, well, I can, actually. I can still make content. I can still be critical of it. But it's not great. You know, it's 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 regulated beyond belief. It's regulated itself into oblivion. It's, it, it, you know, for a country with so much money and potential... There's very little to do. You just can't do anything there. Yeah, I, it sounds a little bit like Canada. We're just we drown in red tape and bureaucracy here. Oh, well, just simple things like. Uh, let me give you a very simple example. I, you might have heard me talk about it the other night, but 
there's a 24 hour supermarket here i jump on my scooter for a start i can ride a, a moped here without having to go and do a bike test and pay 300 quid and all that madness then get mot then get this and pay all for it's just crazy money here you can go into a shop buy a scooter and ride it out <laughs> And yeah. it's amazing. And, and because of that, people actually do. So the roads aren't clogged up with one person in a big car. You'll get one person on a scooter, sometimes four. I've been here two years. I've seen one tiny little accident. No one got a, a little bit of plastic got broken on the fairings. And, you know, so I can do that. I drove up to the, the supermarket. I can park, just, just pull up in front of the supermarket. I don't have to find somewhere five miles away and pay 20 quid, which is what it is an hour in Soho. 20 quid an hour parking in Soho. Ooh, yeah. Sometimes 80. That's that's off peak, right? So I can just pull up outside the shop. No crash helmet. Now, don't get me wrong. I think safety is quite important, but it's one road away. And when I go up there after two in the morning, there's no one on the road. So, you know, and I, I go along at about 10 miles an hour so I can keep looking at everything. It's not dangerous. When I get to the crossroads, there's no one there. So when the light's red, you're allowed to ride across it. There's no cameras everywhere. England's got about one camera for every 30 people or something ridiculous. And if you do that in England, they're going to come and you're going to get a letter through the post, £100 fine. You crossed the road. There was no one there. It was not a problem. You can't even do basics like that. It's just insane. And, I, you know, I, the first time I'd done it, I just was sitting there, just sitting there, not crossing this empty road where you can see both ways, miles. <laughs> And and these, the odd Cambodian was just coming next to me and carrying on going. I thought, this is mad. Why am I sitting there? And I remembered, oh, yeah, because I'm English and I've been doing this forever. And if I took my Cambodian girlfriend to England and my mum pulls up at a, a, a crossroads and sits there for 10 minutes when there's no cars, my missus is going to be going, what the fuck <laughs> happening? And then and imagine, and then I'll have to say to her, well, the thing is, there's 20 cameras on us at the moment, and they've got um, yeah. um, um, number plate recognition, and we'll get a thing through the post. What? And then all that license fee stuff and the BBC. Yeah. And, and if you oh, don't pay it, you won't be able to renew your license. And then if you don't have a license, the next time you get dinged, you're going to fucking end up in court and then if you yeah. don't pay that you're going to end up in collections and oh, then your and you, life is you, fucked <laughs> and you've missed one out there when they come round your house the bailiffs and just kick your door in storm in and nick all your stuff that happens go on youtube you can see the videos I haven't paid your tv license you don't even have to watch bbc you're meant to have a tv license to own a television so you can't own a telly and watch channel 4 itv and not the other, not the BBC. And if that, if you haven't got a license, you open the door because you're a nice bloke, and someone's knocked at your door. It might be a mate. Open the door. That's it. As soon as you've opened the door, they'll push you out of the way. Come in and walk off with your stereo, your your DVD player, your laptop. Yeah, lovely. That wouldn't happen out here. <laughs> so you know what I mean. And then things like being able to park up my bike on the side of the road because it hasn't got yellow lines on it. I can just put it there. Oh, what 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 a luxury to be able to stop and just get off my bike. And then and then there's a p lovely big pedestrianised areas. I mentioned this. Sorry, I keep saying this, but you know I'm probably being repetitive. But they're not chucking you out of parks at eight o'clock in the evening. And then there's no signs yeah. everywhere saying no ball games. You're not allowed yeah. to enjoy this. Can't play here. You know, there's kids. There's kids families all sorts up at the pedestrianized here till sometimes they sit there till the sun comes up there's no alcohol no tin cans rolling everywhere people puking and fighting not part of the culture and why is that in england me and all my mates got was started drinking as kids we were doing acid at 16 we were snorting yeah. speed at 17 you know i'm 47 i think i've lost about 30 friends to drugs and alcohol yeah yes yeah, i can uh, i can relate it's very similar to the kids I grew up with. And why? Why Why do so many kids go for those things? Well, it's obvious everything we've been talking about on this podcast. Because yeah. all the things that are important and all the things that you actually need as a human have been taken away from us and sold back to us in a crappy simulated version. Here's the thing, though. Uh, you mentioned um, you get a bit of flack sometimes from other you know, maybe uh, people in the distant right or people who uh, have similar opinions to you um, for being not just outside of the country, but I've also seen you catch a bit of flack 
for um, being a bit of the degenerate, which is not yeah. a judgment because yeah, as no, am I. Course. But um, <laughs> and and that always kind of uh, it doesn't trouble me so much, I guess. But I just it seems so counterproductive because I think there's actually quite a lot of us, yeah. you know, who um, maybe who you know who definitely are not on the kind of progressive commie train, but who also are not strict, you know, classic traditionalist Republicans or something. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Well, I'm, I've had this argument with people, and, you know, my point is it, it's, it doesn't attract damaged, broken people to the movement. Because if you're going to say to a teenager today, we don't smoke weed around here, well, you're not going to hear from them again because most kids do these days, or certainly a huge percentage do. You know, it, people have to be realistic. I, drugs pretty much ruined my life, but they kind of didn't, didn't as well. And I would never advise someone to do the amount of drugs I've done or, and end up in addiction. But be realistic. You have to enjoy life as well. And I, 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 I you know, I think, I think the reason I attract a lot of young people is because I have, I have had that past and they, they don't feel like they're being naughty and that they can be honest about what they get up to at the weekend. And you, I don't think you're on the one hand, you can say we've got a broken, atomized, disaffected youth that's turned to drugs and then say we need radical cultural change if we're not going to bring those people on board because of what they're doing. What they're doing, what they're doing, because uh, the culture has failed them. So don't shame them for it. Don't guilt them for it. Just try and offer them something else. Yeah. And I think even among, not just among kids, but like people more in, in our age range too, that, you know, grew up, Bef kind of before all of this SJW yeah. craziness really hit the mainstream and like I know for me as a teenager and stuff like um, being hyper individualistic um, totally willing and eager to offend um, you know all of these things were I don't know it was kind of part of our youth culture I guess or something and um and now, as you know, twenty years down the down the road, we're all kind of going like, "What the fuck is going on?" So, <laughs> I think to try and say like, "Oh, you know, well, if you smoke dope or you um, you know don't lead a, a traditional lifestyle, then then you're um, you're somehow not on board," is really no. counterproductive, yeah. and it's really I, uh missing a bigger picture. I absolutely agree with you, and also, you know, uh, I think I think all drugs should be legal anyway. But I think the way of treating that is, I, I think if people had, I feel like a stuck record at the moment. But if people had the things in their life that they actually needed, that humans need, you know, families, groups, all that sort of stuff, responsibilities, yeah. they wouldn't want to take drugs anyway and i think it's fair enough like i just said you can't on the one hand say we're screwed and then the on, on the other hand not to expect that to show itself there's this lovely um canadian bloke actually he's a he's a doctor and addiction specialist called gabor mate or mate i don't know and he tells his story of this old rat experiment called the rat park and in the 60s they done an experiment where they got this big cage they put a rat in it and they put, you might know this one, and they, there was a little box, like a, a, a water at the end, and the, the one next to it was water with cocaine in it. And the rat yeah. goes and drinks a bit of water, then he tries the cocaine, and he'll keep drinking that cocaine till it gives him a heart attack. It can happen in an hour, can happen in a day, but he'll keep drinking the, the water with cocaine. And this was used to uh, underpin the ideas of addiction and what drugs do to you and all that. Then in the mid-70s, a different uh, addiction specialist made a cage that he called the Rat Park. And it had tunnels and bridges. It had a whole family of rats, not just one. There was like 20 of them. And they're all related, you know, the, 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 the dominant male, the mother, the, the kids and the cousins, all this. And there was loads to do. There were things to gnaw. There were wheels to run around. It was huge, this thing. Yeah. And in that cage, he had the water and he had the cocaine. I think they said that less than half of them even tried the cocaine and none of them went back after the first go because 
They didn't feel the need to escape. They didn't want to escape. They wanted more connection. They were loving it. They had family and all the things we've talked about in this podcast. They had it all. They had what they needed. And you know, addiction for me is the opposite of connection. You know, if 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 you've got connection, meaningful relationships in your life, why would you want to take drugs? Because they take you away from people. Now, I get it yeah. occasionally. Occasionally you would, because it's a bit of fun. But regularly or addictively, no. Because it's going to jeopardise those things that you actually value. It's a, I like that Rat Park thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice demonstration. It, but I think I, I don't, I'm not sure I answered your question, because I think you're saying that it's all right, it's all right to be a bit degenerate occasionally and while I agree with you I still think in a better society we probably wouldn't which I'm yeah. not sure is what you wanted Aria well <laughs> it's not um, um, it's not that that's not I, I, I agree with you in a lot of ways I just was thinking more in terms of the kind of uh, cultural change I guess you know, like I talked, um, I talked to the amaz- to the amazing atheist a few years ago on this podcast um, when Jordan Peterson was kind of more in the limelight, and TJ was was kind of uh, taking an anti Peterson stance, and his reasoning was that um, you know you need chaos. Chaos is the is the real kind of cultural driver. It's a real thing that brings change that takes systems down that uh, you know is really what kind of moves the wheels I guess and he was kind of saying you know there's there's a place for the the response the life based on responsibility and and all of these things but I guess it was kind of a an argument for you know that you still do need some element of subversion you know? No, I, I agree, but I think it would be more the kind of thing we see in primitive societies where drugs would be used for... In- I know you're not only talking about drugs, but it's a kind of yeah. example. I think yeah. they would be used in sort of ritual, um, in ritualistic environments to celebrate certain things or to mark, um, you know, uh, children becoming adults or a birth or a death. You know th- those kinds of situations where they'd be part of something and they'd be respected and understood. I think that I think that it would be a more it would have a function rather than just an escape. Yeah, than just a constant search for escape. Yeah, because you wouldn't want to. You know, I'll give yeah. you an example. As you know, I spent most of my life taking ridiculous amounts of drugs, and they've got very few um, good uh, things going for them, but. When I've been with this girl recently, I I grew a load of weed out here because the climate's near perfect and the old bill don't give a shit, really. Um, They kind of do, but, you know, again, they're not stupid about it. Um, And I smoked weed since I was about 16. It it slacked off a bit when I was a smackhead because it was expensive. But I smoked one of the... I smoked one joint, and I haven't smoked for a few years, and I just felt that I was missing out with time with my missus. It was just, she was only here for a few days, and for one day there was this big slab of insanity between us. And the same thing happened with boozing. We went out drinking, and the night we were drinking, we only had like three or four cocktails, but cocktails out here are <laughs> something else. There's no optics or measures. It's just half a pint they're, of They're vodka. not weighing the bottles at the no. end of the night? <laughs> it's quite something. And the, the actual night out drinking was lovely. Um, you know, we had a slow dance on this top of this, this bar on top of a skyscraper, and it was all quite romantic. But I'm getting on a bit, and four or five cocktails, you pay the price, as you probably know. And the next day, I was all a bit fluffy around the eyes. You know, I, didn't, I wasn't really connecting. I sort of spent most of the day in bed, and I just felt as if, it was a, it, the sacrifice was too big. Not the pain of the hangover, because it wasn't pain. I didn't have a headache or anything, but just, just I was. It had separated us, yeah. and when I only had three days of her, I wanted to be connecting with her. Yeah, yeah. You you feel that loss of time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And speaking about loss of time, so I'm going to have to wrap this up, my dear, because it's now half past eight. 
<laughs> I know, I know. It's it's run long. It's run long for sure. But it's, oh, it's been, been a good. pleasure. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Well, well, to wrap it up, then you mentioned um, that soon you're going to be on Posey Parker's channel, is it, or is she yeah. coming back? On, yeah. No, I um, I think <laughs> I think she didn't want to. I think she wants her people around her, so I'm going to go on hers. Excellent, excellent. Anything I mean, else? There, there's uh, quite there's quite a funny bit of tension between me and her. I mean, I like her; she likes me, but it, it's quite a sort of a, there's quite a friendly kind of antagonism between us. So, it's yeah, no, you could see it in the last podcast. It, it, it was it's good, it's good, it's enjoyable. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> and every any, time I get else? in a every time I get in a chat and I just say hi, and she'll go. Hello, good evening, Mr. Dangerfield. As if like <laughs> anticipating, and it, yeah, no, it's nice. I really like her. But yeah, yeah. I'll be on her it's probably a couple of weeks. But you know, if if your people, um, you can find me on YouTube or Telegram or Twitter, and um, you'll find out when I'll be on poses. Excellent. And anything else uh, on the horizon besides the much anticipated novel? Well, just the novel, and I tell you, it's quite, it's quite the reader. You know, and you're a creative person. Um, I, sometimes I look at it and I just think, this is just 120,000 words. This isn't a story. <laughs> and, you know, in, in that genre, it's kind of literary fiction, although it's autobiographical. And the, main, the, the rule number one in that genre is give the reader a reason to turn the page and I can safely say that for what will at the moment be about 320 pages, there is not a single reason to do that. So, it, uh, so sometimes I'm really down about it. But at the moment, I, I'm, I think it's a work of genius. So, um, yeah, you've caught me at a good point on the sort of wavelength of ups and downs. So, yeah, that's that. But, you know, even that... What do I do? Do I self-publish? Got the technology, make more money self-publishing. I've got the audience online, blah, blah. Or do I yep. go the traditional route where I'd almost certainly make less money, but then I do stand a chance of it entering into the canon of literature, which you don't if you self-publish. Even if you self-publish and sell 50,000 copies, it doesn't enter the canon. People don't talk about it as a novel. It's really weird. So if I self-publish, yeah. it could be available on my website by May. If I go the traditional route, even if I get an agent or a publisher agree in May, it could be two or three years. So, oh, what to yeah. do? Yeah, it's, but it is a tough call. Um, I don't know. I I can give no advice in that. <laughs> unfortunately, having having not made it past the uh, the words on a page and alternating between being really stoked on it and then totally full of shame and hate for it the next day. Uh, <laughs> this is interesting. How how far did you get in? You've tried writing novels. Yeah, I've actually I've been working on a on a long story for a little over a year and a half now. Wow. Yeah. And how much have you got done? Oh, geez, it's hard to say. Maybe Rough, uh, roughly fifty pages. Hundred pages. Fifty pages on Word or fifty pages in novel format. Uh, on Word. Wow! Just, just you know, big paid blocks of yeah. And but, but you're and and how are you feeling about it at the moment? Um, pretty good actually. Amazing. Not bad. Not well, you've bad. done fifty pages. The art part is starting. You know, everyone talks a good novel, but to actually or a short story, but to actually sit down and get it done singles you out. You're now in something like the the one percent. Amazing. Thank you. That's good. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but uh, all right. Well, I will. I will let you go, Chris. Thank you very, very much for uh, hanging out with me for a while. It's been an absolute pleasure, and um, everyone should check out Chris Dangerfield on YouTube and Telegram and Twitter and all of those regular places. I think you have a bit shoot. Uh, as I well, do. Right? I do. But yeah. if you if you get hold of me on YouTube, my channel's called Dangerfield, and you can't miss it. If you get hold of me there, you'll find all my other links there. But to be honest with you, for a, for a viewer, YouTube's the best one. I think that's the most content, the most regular. Oh yeah, and I mean this is uh, top notch content. Like some of the best storytelling you will find on YouTube by far, for my mind. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right, excellent. Well. Um, thank you. 
Thank you, Chris. Uh, you're welcome back anytime. We should talk about novel writing one time. Absolutely.